It's June 20th, 2005, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Infinite monkey theorem, the philosophical proposition that if a monkey sits at a typewriter long enough it'll produce the complete works of Shakespeare, was given an artsy twist on this day in 2005 when the paintings of a chimpanzee named Congo went under the hammer at the prestige London auction house Bonhams. And I love that it was reported at the time as three abstract paintings by the chimp Congo as if, you know, he was going to be doing cubism or renaissance portraiture or something. (laughs) His style is described as abstract impressionism and, you know, it is quite hard to imagine a chip mastering any other kind of impressionism. (laughs) (laughs) The director of modern and contemporary art at Bonhams, Howard Rutkowski, said, I would sincerely doubt that chimpanzee art has ever been auctioned before. (laughs) Safe claim. (laughs) I don't think anyone's been crazy enough to do this. I'm sure other auction houses think it's completely mad. But it proved not to be madness because the three paintings by Congo smashed their estimate and sold for more than 25,000 US (laughs) dollars. Well, Congo's artistic mentor was this guy, Desmond Morris, who is the absolute ideal person to mentor a chimp in art. He's both a professional zoologist, he's the author of the book The Naked Ape, and a talented surrealist painter. So in 1956, he had moved from Oxford, where he'd been doing postdoctoral research in zoology, he moved to London as the head of Granada's TV and film unit and was based at London Zoo. And so he'd been put there to oversee making films about animal behaviour. And presented Zoo Time on Children's yeah. ITV. On which Congo was a frequent guest. Yes. It was hosted yeah. from the late 50s onwards. So he was not, I mean, he was probably one of the more familiar artists to the average person. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Morris had actually chosen Congo out of all of the um, chimpanzees he had his, at his disposal because Congo was the most exuberant of all of the zoo's chimps and he, he thought that he was going to be exuberant artistically as well. well like, I've got this TV show, he's looking at yeah. the apes, he's being like, come on guys, what can you do? Everyone needs <laughs> yeah. to have a talent. I need apes that are good in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> which is how Congo the chimp became famous for being an artist, which is how we get to this day where his paintings are worth something. So you had this kind of ideal combination as you were saying of Morris is on the telly Congo's on the telly a generation of children grow up seeing him on the telly Morris himself is not only a zoologist and a popular psychologist who then goes on later has this massively successful book I mean you mentioned The Naked Ape it sold 20 million copies in 1967 so when he then became famous as a psychologist with this book which was basically all about how human beings are just animals like apes it was a kind of popular Darwinism book You had the cachet, but also his background as a surrealist. I mean, he wanted to be an artist before he was a TV presenter and a producer and a zoologist and a psychologist. And in fact, he had served as director of the ICA in London, where he met Dali and Francis Bacon and Henry Moore and Pablo Picasso and Barbara Hepworth. So... It's a really interesting mix. It's kind of like David Attenborough's a similar thing, you know, was the controller of BBC Two, specialising in all kinds of artsy things, but is now seen solely as wildlife documentarian. The, the media was so small then, and the kind of figures who were able to be in it was so confined to people who had all been to Oxbridge and knew each other, that actually you could be a specialist in all these fields. And that is the combination that allowed Congo to become a household name, to become a mascot of this TV show, You know, because painting chimps had been done before by Russian scientists, by American scientists, just never on children's ITV. And the way Congo approached painting does suggest that there is something like innate talent. It's not just proof that an ape is physically capable of holding a paintbrush and manipulating it. But you look at what he actually could do. He did things that no other painting apes have done before or since. So he could draw shapes, he could could paint a circle and Mm. his work. And now I saw Morris talking about this and saying that, you know, his work shows that he's aware of symmetry of composition. I thought, wow, 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 what a load of nonsense. But when you look at the paintings, there is symmetry. You know, if there's Mm. a colour on one side, there's usually a matching splash of colour on the other side. And it does to all intents and purposes. I'm not an artistic expert by any means, but it could easily fit into an abstract art exhibit. You wouldn't look at it and be like, a monkey painted that. Yeah. (laughs) And also, he had a very distinct idea of when he'd finished a work. So Mm. his technique was he would give the brush back to Morris at the end of the work when he's done. It's it's a sense of this is completed, this is finished, I've said everything I want to say. He had an idea of when he had made a complete artistic statement. That feels like a human quality, but it isn't. And he'd also completely kick off if the 
canvas was taken away from him before he'd finished making his statement, yeah. which also seems quite human. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, he did have a bit of an artistic temperament. So this painting period went on from 1955 to 1959. And during that time, he produced about 400 works of art. But then for reasons that are unknown, Morris said that Congo started to obliterate the sheets of paper with large masses of paint. And that was the end of his painting career. And obviously, we'll never know why he suddenly decided that he wasn't doing it anymore. But it does feel very in line with the image of the temperamental artist. Picasso went through his blue period and Congo <laughs> went through his obliteration period. <laughs> well, this is the thing. Desmond Morris's sense of humour is very evident from his writing. One of the things that made him a popular science writer was, you know, it's entertaining and light-hearted. He wrote one book called Christmas Watching, which is, you know, not dissimilar to the Christmas episodes we put out last year about <laughs> the origins of various things. Not very scientific, just a bit of fun. And I do think this background of him being an artist and then being a, a, a TV presenter, etc., came into play. I think he wanted to say something that he knew would sell. He wanted to say that anyone can create art and that commercialism ruins the natural instinct to create. So I'm not saying he didn't see this evidenced, but I think he went looking for it. One of the things he did, otherwise why would you conduct this experiment, was he would pay Congo, quote unquote, for having done a painting. And according to Morris, when he paid him, I, with a reward, like a chocolate biscuit or whatever monkeys are into, he would then lose interest in the work. Now, mm. to me, that's because a chocolate biscuit is more fun than painting a picture. But Morris interpreted that as, look what happens when you pay for art, it devalues it. Mm. Well, Congo by this stage was living in this luxurious cage within the zoo's television unit. And <laughs> at the age of five, he, he eventually attacked Morris's secretary and was deemed to be a danger to humans and was ultimately returned to the main and presumably non-luxurious monkey house. And that's where he stayed for the rest of his life. So he sort of had this kind of uh, artistic pain and suffering filled end story as yes. well and like many artists he died young of tb at the age of 10 in 1964 <laughs> mm. <laughs> i mean the funny thing about the whole business of congo is as you say it seems like something that was intended to make statements prince philip was a customer do you need to say right. any more than that like, I well, can see exactly. exactly how that would appeal to your sense of humour. Showing people around right. Windsor Castle. Oh, that was pitched by a chimp, actually. Right. <laughs> That's the joke, isn't it? Yeah, in fact, Salvador Dali, on looking at the artworks, quipped that the hand of the chimpanzee is quasi-human, whereas the hand of Jackson Pollock is totally animal. <laughs> when you find Dali a bit much to hang out with. <laughs> oh, my God, Do you God, know what I mean? Entirely. Just like yeah. the moustache. Quipping. Yes. Just stop quipping. Yes. Just it's fine. You're, you're a talented artist. There was this famous uh, hoax in 1964 where the European art scene was apparently all abuzz with the introduction of this French avant-garde artist who was called Pierre Brasseau. And art connoisseurs had been brought together to this gallery in Gothenburg in Sweden where they'd been shown these new works by this new artist. And one of the popular art critics of the time, Rolf Anderberg, said, Brasso paints with powerful strokes, but also with clear determination. His brush strokes twist with furious fastidiousness. Pierre is an artist who performs with the delicacy of a ballet dancer. And only later did it come out that actually Pierre Brasso was a West African chimpanzee who lived in the Swedish zoo. And it was this big joke on the art establishment by a journalist named Oka Axelsson. The, the whole business of Congo sets off that same alarm bell in your mind. You're like, was this some sort of complicated joke on the art world rather than just being this particularly talented animal. Yeah, and when Morris first exhibited Congo's work in 1957 at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, one particularly striking criticism came from a reader of the New Statesman who wrote to its letters page, just because certain humans during the past 20 years have chosen to paint like psychotics hardly justifies a prestige organisation in selling the reflex twitching of apes at 10 guineas a throw. <laughs> I think probably the harshest criticism was from US customs officials who uh, deemed that it was worthy of import duty because uh, paint, quote, placed on canvas by a subhuman animal with no rational mind or powers of imagination does not meet our test for works of art. Wow. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I was joking earlier and saying you wouldn't imagine that an ape would do anything other than abstract paintings. Actually, since Congo... There's been Coco, which is an ape living in California that's learned American Sign Language so she can communicate what her art was. She can answer the question, what's that? Cool. Um, and the answer is, like, it's a bird, for example. So 
the ape thinks actually that it is a representative image, not an abstract one. Did you hear about Picasso over in uh, in South Africa? <laughs> the title tells us everything we need to know. I think. I guess it does. <laughs> Tomorrow. Dolce & Gabbana, Versace, Burberry, Ralph Lauren, Tiffany, Purcell, Ray-Ban. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.